I have with me the one, the only, longtime legendary, legendary radio host, and now running for governor of California in the recall election of uh, Gavin Newsom. And I've known this person for, if not 30 years, close to it. And he's been in the forefront, and I'm not making it up, folks, really. He's been in the forefront of this fight to not only save America, but to save California. And I thank God he's running for governor. And it seemed to be so timely. You know how things happen when they need to be happening? Larry Elder is here. He's running for governor. Larry, thank you, man, for running for governor, and thank you for coming on. Jesse Lee, thank you so much. And you're right, we've known each other about 30 years. And you might remember when we first met each other, uh, I went down to your place and I was walking around and there was some, somebody lying on the couch. Uh, and there was another guy lying on the couch and they weren't particularly well dressed. And I yeah. thought maybe you had some relatives crashing. I said, Jesse, who are these people? And you said, well, they're homeless, or at least they used to be. I said, you invited homeless people inside your home? You said, yes. Uh, and you talked about, to me about how you've been counseling people and your organization and I was blown away. And we became fast friends from that point on. Yeah. Well, man, I definitely appreciate your friendship. You've been a total inspiration in my life. Larry, I have to tell you, you running for governor seemed to be right on time. It's not like before time or after time passed. Right. It seemed to be right on time. And thank you for that, too. The, our home was, we have a home for men in our nonprofit organization, Bond. Uh, Larry, what made you decide to run now? Well, one more thing, though, before we leave you, Reverend. Uh, I also read your book, From Rage to Responsibility, several times. It is a primer on what to do to overcome uh, anger, yes. uh, o overcome this uh, feeling that you're a victim, yeah. overcome this idea that white people are oppressors and black people are eternally the oppressed. Uh, and I recommend the book to anybody and everybody who's got a hole in his or her soul because of the same thing. Now, as for why I ran, Jesse, uh, I, I never, ever, ever thought, Jesse Lee, that I'd be running for office. I mean, the <laughs> last time I ran for office, fifth grade class president. Yeah. I'd be a guy named William Moy. I carry three out of four roles. They're still cleaning up the blood. But I never, ever thought I'd run. I, I thought about running against Barbara Boxer some years ago, but the Republican Party did not back me. They backed Carly Fiorina. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't decide. I decided not to run in the primary. So that was pretty much it. Uh, a number of people I respect approached me, including a woman named Jenny Sand, S-A-N-D. I didn't know who she was, although it turned out I had met her about 25 years ago, but I had forgotten. She's a local activist, and she just put together this series of papers about why Larry Elder ought to run, and she emailed them to me. And I would get them, and I would read them with my girlfriend, Nina, and I said, who's this crazy person who wants me to run for governor? <laughs> she kept writing, she kept writing Jesse Lee, so I said, let me just meet with her for five or 10 minutes, have coffee, and get her off my back. So Nina and I met with her. Four hours later, uh, we still had not yet gotten rid of her, but I still didn't decide to run. Then Dennis Prager, uh, who was very responsible for my getting into the radio business, yeah. he approached me and asked me to run. And I told him, hell no. And I told him why. I said, the legislature is two thirds Democrat in the Senate, two thirds Democrat in the assembly. Uh, and if I were to veto something, it could be overridden quite easily. Later on, by the way, I found out not a single veto has been overridden since the 1980s, which is one of the reasons I decided to give it some thought. But again, I still said no. And then a, a friend of mine and pastor named Pastor Jack Hibbs approached me. He's with the Cal Calvary Church in, uh, in Costa Mesa in Orange County. And he asked me to run and also outline why he thought I could win. And uh, I still was not really that interested. And then a guy named Lionel Chetland, don't know if you know Lionel, he's been a friend of mine for some 30 years. He's a longtime filmmaker. He also asked me to run. Again, I, I, then I decided, <laughs> Jesse Lee, let me talk to normal people. So I talked to my barber. I talked to the guy who drives me every now and then, my gardener, other people I've known in my life for 20, 25 years. And I kept waiting for somebody to say, are you nuts? Are you crazy? You have a wonderful life. You're making some decent money. Why in the world would you want to put your private life on for public display to be ridiculed, to be picked apart by your enemies, and you will be making enemies? Why in the world would you want to do that? Yeah. Nobody said that. And finally, it got to the point where I said, if not you, who, if not now, when? And now I've gone from, from hell no to no to hmm to <laughs> now I'm in it to win it. And I'm asking people to go to electelder.com and throw a little something in the tip jar because my opponent, and I consider my opponent, Jesse Lee, not to be my fellow Republicans, any of them would be better than Gavin Newsom. Yeah. My opponent is Gavin Newsom. This guy has shut down this state 
in the most in the more severe way than any other state. It is estimated that some one third of small business people have lost their businesses forever. I ran a small business for about 14 years and I didn't, didn't go bankrupt. I didn't liquidate it. I sold it and it kept going for years after I uh, after I uh, stopped doing it and came into came back to L.A. to do radio and television. My point is, it is hard, hard, hard to run a business, yeah. let alone a small business. Almost half of them fail, and those that succeed are often just payroll to payroll. And this man slammed these businesses down and killed the hopes and dreams of, of many men and women here in California, uh, and never for those businesses to return. And then, of course, you have the rising crime. We have crime up in, in virtually every major city in California. It's up in San Francisco. It's up in L.A. Uh, it's up in San Diego. You have the, the homelessness crisis. And this guy thinks that you can just get out of this by having a house first po uh, 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 policy without dealing with the underlying reason, uh, as you've always tried to do, why people are homeless in the first place. And, and getting back to the first part about him shutting down this, this state uh, in the uh, coronavirus fight, here is a man who sat at that French laundry restaurant with the very lobbyist, Jesse Lee, and the medical professions who drafted the mandates that they were violating by not wearing masks and by not <laughs> engaging in social distancing yeah. while having his own children enjoy in-person private education and he exempted his own winery from the mandates. And regarding education, my goodness, already before the pandemic, 75% of black boys in California cannot read at state levels of proficiency and those levels are already low. Nearly 50% of third graders cannot. And again, those levels are already low. You know, Jesse, I went to um, Crenshaw High School that's the that's a, a yeah. high school that was featured in Boys in the Hood. Only two percent of kids at Crenshaw High School today are math proficient, and it is supposedly a crip school. I know that because Ice T went to my school after I did, and said so he chose it because he wanted to go to a crip school. Now, who sends their kid to a school <laughs> where only two percent are math proficient, and it's a crip school if they have an option out? I support school choice, so the money follows the child rather than the other way around. The teachers' union, the largest funder of Gavin Newsom adamantly opposed to choice uh, because the teachers are not automatic uh, uh, members of the union and the dues are not automatic take, automatically taken from their salary. And there, it is estimated that of the 300,000 public school teachers here in, um, in, in, here in California, nationwide, roughly 5% of all public school teachers are incompetent. If that applies to California, you're talking about 15,000 incompetent teachers. Many of them end up uh, in schools in South Central. They don't send them to uh, the West Side. They don't send them to the Valley. Uh, they send them to South Central. And I'm not just talking about teachers. I'm talking about principals and administrators. Uh, if you look at where teachers send their own school age kids, Jesse Lee, I saw a study that shows nationwide around 10% of families send their own kids to uh, private school. Roughly 6% of back, black families do. 44%, I kid you not, Philadelphia public school teachers with school age kids put their own kids in private school. 39% yeah. Chicago public school teachers put their own school age kids in private school. And here in Los Angeles, it is estimated that the uh, uh, public school teachers at LAUSD, the Los Angeles Unified School District, are twice as likely to put their own school age kids in private school compared to families without teachers in, uh, without uh, uh, public school teachers in their households. This is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And why the Democrats still get the votes of black and brown parents when polls show that they overwhelmingly support school choice is beyond me. And I think I can convince a lot of independents and Democrats that you are being betrayed by the very Democrats that year after year after year you vote for. Yeah, I totally agree. Gavin Newsom said last week that Democrats face profound consequences if he loses this recall election. What does he mean? Do you know what he mean by that? Well, that's about the only thing I agree with he's ever said. <laughs> because what it means is people are fed up. Uh, Democrats are fed up. Crime doesn't have a color. Yeah. Homelessness doesn't have a color. The way this man shut down the coronavirus, shut down the state to fight the coronavirus doesn't have a color. And the price of housing doesn't have a color. Speaking of which, Jesse Lee, as you know, my father came to California right after the war in 1945. He worked two full-time jobs as a, as a janitor cleaning toilets. And believe it or not, on that salary, he had a stay-at-home wife, my mother, uh, and uh, she was able to stay at home until the last of us uh, was in middle school. Yeah. He saved his nickels and dimes and bought a house in South Central Los Angeles. It's good news for us because it's still in the family. That house is now worth $600,000. Somebody with an eighth grade dropout education like my dad, if he worked three or four jobs, could not afford to get the DP and get that house. Yeah. And the average price of a home in California has now hit $800,000. That is 150% above the national average. 
One of the frequent guests I have on my radio show, Jesse Lee, is a economist, brilliant guy named Leo Hanian. Uh, he's an econ professor at UCLA, done a lot of work on the price of housing in California. And he says, because of the environmental rules and regulations, the average price of a home in California is literally 50% more than it otherwise would be. This is absolutely outrageous. And if I'm fortunate enough to be elected governor, I'm going to do something about that. Well, it's going to happen, I believe. I have hope. Um, <laughs> what, what I have to tell you this, Larry, I, um, I go to the gym every other day or so, and at one point, people who knew you, because you've been around for a long time, you were known as the, South, the sage of South Central. Right. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. I still call myself that. <laughs> the sage of South Central, the Prince of Pico Union, the Czar of Common Sense, the great El Dursky. Yeah. Don Lorenzo. <laughs> and, and and I remember when you were going through hell, they were trying to ban you, they were attacking you and calling you names. And right. I would t over the years I would talk to different guys about you at the gym and other places. They didn't like you at all because right. of your view. i right as of today, since you announced that you were running for governor, I only had one black or white person disagree with you running. And these people are not just Republicans, but they're Democrats and atheists and non-atheists, and they love the fact that you're running, and they have all said it just seemed like the right time. They definitely have seen what Gavin Newsom and the Democratic Party have done to California, and they are ready for someone like you. So you're getting support without even, I don't know, without even being aware of it for people who didn't support you before. They're for you no, now. No, I, no, I, I feel that, Jesse Lee, and, and you're right, that the tide has changed. But the people that opposed me the most were not regular people. They were the, the black intellectuals. Yes. They were the ones who disliked me. Yeah. The regular people know what I'm talking about. Tupac Shakur once said that we need the police more than anybody else because we don't want to live next to a drug dealer. We don't live, want to live next to a criminal. Uh, and the people who are hurt the most by this war on the police are people living in the inner city, black and brown people who are disproportionately victims of crime. And there's a magazine, Jesse Lee, called CEO Magazine. It's been around for 17 years. And for 17 consecutive years, they've asked CEOs, which is the best state in which to do business and which is the worst state. And for each of the 17 years of this magazine's existence, California has been determined to be the worst state in which to do business. Yeah. And the people who are leaving California, and for the first time in our state's history, there's a net migration out. These are people making between 50 and 100K who can't get that first house. Now, often what they do is they go to Texas, they go to Tennessee, and they go to other places, and they bring their politics with them yeah. because they can't connect the dots between the left-wing policies that they voted for and the price of house that's caused them to leave California. I can explain why it is that Gavin Newsom and the uh, majority, supermajority in the, in the Sacramento legislature is causing all these problems, and I can explain this in ways that regular people can, can understand, and I'm doing that. That's why a growing number of regular people are now supporting me and are supporting my candidacy. I love the fact that and I've said over and over again that the Republicans are kind of weak in the way that they present themselves. They don't really fight, fight back with authority. You know, right. like, they really don't, they pretend they don't see what's happening or they are worried about being called a racist or something. They don't really fight back. That's you right. have that fight in you. You're not afraid of the name calling. You're not afraid of whatever they want to say. You have that fight in you to fight back. Did that come from what, what you've already gone through, or were you raised that way? Uh, you know, my dad was a Marine. He was a tough, tough guy. I wrote a book about how I did not like him growing up because he was so hard on us. <laughs> uh, but my father, a lifelong Republican, always said, hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. You cannot control the outcome, Larry, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you moan and groan about what somebody else did to you, uh, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and say to yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, he always said, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen to you. How you address those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. Yeah. This is a guy, I mentioned, uh, eighth grade dropout, left home when he was 13 years old, got kicked out of the house by his mother because he was quarreling with his mother's then boyfriend. She sided with the boyfriend and threw my father out of the house, never to return. Black boy, Athens, Georgia, Jim Crow South at the beginning of the Great Depression. I defy you to find very many people who had a hand dealt like that. Yeah. And if anybody had a reason to moan and groan about how systemically racist America is, it would be my father. But my lifelong Republican dad always said, Democrats want to give you something for nothing. And when you try and get something for nothing, you almost always end up getting nothing for something. Yeah, absolutely, man. 
Um, so just for the folks to know, you were born and raised in South Central, so it's not like you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth. No, I, I was not on. I was not born on third base. <laughs> I thought I hit a triple. Yeah. I, I was born in Pico Union, which then and now is a heavily Hispanic area. Yeah. So we moved uptown, or so we thought. The South Central. We were the second black family on our in our neighborhood, uh, and that's the house that's now worth six hundred thousand dollars. You know, regarding what you said about Republicans being afraid of being of being called racist, you're absolutely right. And I always say this to my Republican friends who are afraid of telling the truth. And by the way, Malcolm X once said, "I'm for the truth, no matter who's telling it." I say this: pick up your magic wand, wave it over America. Let's remove every smidgen of racism from the hearts of white America. Now, everybody white thinks like Mother Teresa. <laughs> Do we still have the problem of 70% of black uh, kids brought into the world without a father married to the mother, an increase of 25% back in 1965? Uh, is the, do we still have a 50% dropout rate in many of our urban high schools? And those who do graduate, many of them cannot read, write, and compute at grade level. Do we still have the phenomenon that the number one cause of preventable death for young white men is accidents, like car accidents or drowning accidents? And the number one cause of preventable death for young black boys is homicide, uh, is the rate at which young black boys <clears throat> are killed eight times the rate at which young white boys are killed? If the answer to those series of questions are yes, then I submit to you that systemic racism is not the problem and critical race theory and reparations are not the answer. Yeah, that's right. Larry, why <clears throat> do you, a uh, couple more questions, we'll let you go here, but why do you think that these black liberal politicians pretend to care about the black people and then the black people go, especially the Democrats, they go and vote in these representatives. But once they get in, they don't deal with the issue of the family. They don't deal with the out-of-control school. They don't deal with the virus. They do nothing to stop it. Why do you think that is? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, for votes and for power. If they know that if they keep 13% of the, of, the, of the electorate that's black votes angry, uh, thinking about social justice, thinking about issues of, of systemic racism, They'll go in there like lemmings and pull that lever for the Democratic Party. That's what they're concerned about. They're concerned about power. They're not concerned about dealing with the real problem. And again, the number one problem facing black America is not racism. It's the large number of kids who enter the world without a father married to the mother. Yeah. And by the way, Jesse, it's not just with black families. 50% of Hispanic families, uh, 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 Hispanic children enter the world without a father married to the mother. And I mentioned in 1965, 25% of black children enter the world without a father married to the mother. Now 25% of white kids enter the world without a father married to the mother. 40% of all kids do. And that's because under the welfare state that Lyndon Johnson, a nouveau liberal, uh, launched in 1965, we've incentivized women to marry the government and we've incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And the left cannot have that conversation because they have to look in the mirror and realize they destroyed the family. And all too often, Republicans don't want to engage in that because they feel that they'll be called racist. Uh, they'll, they feel that they'll be, quote, be, be accused of blaming the victim when you're not. You're talking about policies that have created this, and policies can undo this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Two quick questions. Democrats are already running, a, running ass now. And they are, they are trying to say that people like you are connected to the Proud Boys and Donald Trump, and right. this is just money funded by Trump supporters. They're trying to put fear into people again. Right. How will you deal with that? Notice Elizabeth Warren cut an ad for Gavin Newsom. Yeah. And she didn't say, not, didn't say one word about his record on crime, not one word about his record on homelessness, not one word about the way he slammed down this state uh, for coronavirus. Uh, nothing at all about the large number of people who are leaving California because of the price of housing. She said nothing at all about that. She said this was a Trump-driven, uh, Republican-driven deal. Now, I've been asked many times, did you support Donald Trump in 2020? Jesse Lee, I'm a registered Republican. I have not voted for a Democrat since 1976, <laughs> and that was Jimmy Carter, and I regret that. And I'm going to vote for whoever is the standard bearer for the Democratic Party in 2024, no matter whoever who, he or she is. Now, they used to say that this was a, uh, a, a recall effort driven by white supremacists. But after I got into the race, they stopped. They, they dropped that talking point. Yeah. Uh, they're always going to say this because they cannot defend their record. And, and Gavin Newsom recently gave an interview to a series of newspapers. He was very combative, very angry, very edgy. 
and again, blame this on Trump supporters. He cannot defend his record. And that's why 2.2 million people signed that petition, a quarter of whom were independents and Democrats who just voted for his, this man two years earlier. They're fed up, I'm fed up, and most Californians are fed up. Yeah. When you say you vote for and stand the bearer of the Democratic Party, you meant Republican? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Republican Party, no yeah. matter who it's, no matter who that person is. Right. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you for catching that. <laughs> and, and again, go to electelder.com, electelder.com, throw something in the tip jar. Um, you are, uh, the last poll I saw, you are beaten in the poll. I'm not surprised because uh, this recall of, of, of Gavin Newsom is, as you said, is Republicans, Democrats, independents, all people. Uh, it doesn't matter the party, um, what you think, they want Newsom out of there because they have seen what he has done to the state. And so it's not about that. It, and I'm glad to see that you are beaten in the poll. You know, a new one just came out this morning. Don't know whether or not you saw it. I'm up seven points since that last poll has come out. Wow. I'm not worried about the Republican side. I'm worried about the recall side. 50% yeah. plus one voters must vote to recall this man. Uh, and then on the same ballot, it says, who do you want to replace him? But unless 50% plus one vote to recall him, it doesn't matter what we Republicans do. So I'm urging people to remember exactly why 2.2 million people signed that petition, exactly why this man arrogantly sat at that French restaurant. By the way, $12,000 wine tab, just for wine tab that we taxpayers picked up yeah. uh, while ignoring the very, the very mandates. And recently, he imposed another mandate that required you to wear masks when you're at summer camp. And surprise, surprise, his own kids were at summer camp without wearing masks. So the arrogance is what has driven people to sign that petition, and the arrogance is what's going to drive people uh, to recall this man. Well, Larry, you definitely have my not only financial support, but I'm stomping the streets to get the word out. Because if ever we needed you, we need you now. And so tell the people how to donate, what you need from them to help, what we should be doing. Well, go to electelder.com and, and donate, and the largest individual contribution anybody can make is $32,400. Now, this guy has already raised close to $40 million to defeat me. It is estimated he's going to raise between fifty and $75 million. He doesn't have any uh, limits on how much he can raise, how much he can spend. Uh, we do. So this is uh, an unfair fight for all sorts of reasons. But if enough people inside California and outside California go to electelder.com and contribute to my campaign, we have a very good chance of beating this guy and a very good chance of having a change in leadership uh, after September the 14th when the election is held. What do you think your parents would think about you now? They were, <laughs> they were here. Here's the sage from South Central Los Angeles running for governor and look like we hope he will win. What do you think they were thinking? I've thought about that many times, Jesse Lee. <laughs> you know, I lost my mom, my dad about 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And I lost my best friend, my older brother, Kirk. He died on September 13, 2019, two weeks before his 70th birthday. He was at his computer, slumped over, had a heart attack. No Amazing. previous illness. And then, Jesse Lee, I don't think I told you about this. Six months later, uh, his son, uh, my nephew, was found face down, dead in his apartment, also died of a heart attack. Wow. My, susp my suspicion is he was uh, just hurt because of the death of his father. Uh, and so I have no immediate family. My younger brother, Dennis, died of diabetes decades ago. So I have no immediate family to watch what's going on with my life. Man. I often look up and I wonder what they would say. I know my mother would say, my mother would say, go for it. My dad would be worried about my safety and worried about what they would do to me. Uh, because, as you know, the, the left is absolutely devoid of ethics. They'll come after you. Uh, like nobody's business, because unlike us, we believe the other side is just wrong. Right. My mother was a Democrat. My brother was a Democrat. I thought they were just wrong. They believe that we're evil. They believe that we are out to, to hurt people. And so, therefore, they can justify virtually anything that they say, anything that they can do. So my dad would be worried about my safety. My mother would be, go for it, go for it, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're going for it. And may your family soul rest in peace, man. I wasn't aware of your brother and his son as well. Right. Uh, Last thing, tell the people again how to donate, Larry. Congratulations. And this is an exciting, amazing time, man. Well, have them go to electelder.com, electelder.com. Jesse Lee, you've known me almost 30 years. You've never, ever, ever heard me talk about going into politics. This is a new <laughs> game for me. I know. You know the old line, man makes plans, God laughs. And I talked to Pastor Jack Hibbs about my past. Uh, nobody has had a Mother Teresa life. I certainly haven't. Yeah. He said, Larry, every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And I remember something Pat Robertson said when he briefly ran for president. He said, as for the sins of my youth, 
either the Lord has forgiven me or the statute of limitations has run out. <laughs> That's right. I remember when you announced that you were running, I said on my show, watch how the media is going to go after him. They're going to say things about him that's not true or maybe true, but it doesn't matter. We right. need Larry. We need him now. Congratulations, man, and God is with you. I wish you well, all right? And whatever we can do to help, you know how to get us. Jesse Lee, done. Thank you so much for your encouragement. Thank you for your, for your support, uh, and God bless. All right, man. Thank you so much. You got it. Larry Elder, folks, we got to get him in there. <laughs> Amazing. 888-775-3773. 888-77-JESSE. We got to get a minute. What's Larry's website again? Elect Elder. E Electelder.com. Go there, support financially, get the word out. All right? We have a chance now. Let's take advantage of it. Amazing. And don't forget to like, follow, tweet, subscribe. And share the Jesse Lee Peterson radio show, folks. We really appreciate it. We are at war. It is a spiritual battle for the soul of America. And it's going to take all of us to do it. <laughs>